is The Big Bang Evidence for God? What are some of the latest discoveries and theories concerning the Big Bang? This is Reasonable Faith, Conversations with Dr. William Lane Craig. I'm Kevin Harris, and I want to remind you as we begin this conversation that there are many resources like this podcast available at reasonablefaith.org. Transcripts and recordings of Dr. Craig's debates on college campuses around the world. Articles, questions and answers, a discussion forum, and much more. Available now at reasonablefaith.org. Dr. Craig, we've been discussing Big Bang cosmology, and right off the bat, some people of faith and some Christians find this as a threat to their faith in God or to Christianity, that somehow the Big Bang would supplant God. Is that a warranted fear? I don't think so at all, Kevin. The Big Bang doesn't explain why the universe came into being. It's simply a description of the expansion of the universe from its original point before which nothing existed. So it doesn't itself explain why the universe exists or where it came from. You still need to have a cause of the Big Bang. In the third edition of your book, Reasonable Faith, you expand a little bit into some of the latest theories in Big Bang cosmology. Some of those things that are coming down the pike right now and the theories that are being thought over involve multiple universes that perhaps we're not the only universe. There may be a bunch more. Mm-hmm. Is that the multiverse theory? Are we correct? Right. Sometimes that? this is called the multiverse. Uni means one as in unicycle, that would be a you know just a one-wheel thing, and universe would be one world. So a multiverse would be a sort of collection of universes. Or sometimes our universe is called a pocket universe, uh, sort of a little section of a much bigger universe. So this has become quite the rage in contemporary cosmological discussion, the the notion that we may uh, live in a multiverse and our universe is just one bubble or part of this wider reality. And it's getting into popular literature and novels and movies as well. The book from Michael Crichton, Timeline, postulated that we do live in a multiverse. There are multiple universes And we can't travel back in time in the one we're in, but they find a way to step over into the next one, which is very similar to this one, so similar, in fact, that you really can't even tell the difference. And you can go back in time in that one. (laughs) (laughs) So you find a way to step over into the other one. So it's it's gotten into uh, popular literature as, as well. Are there anything to these multiverse theories? Well, yeah, I think you have to say that there is something to them, though... It's important to understand that the motivation behind the multiverse, I think, for many scientists, is to try to ex- to find an explanation for the incredible fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. The universe is so incomprehensibly fine-tuned for the existence of life that this cannot be simply uh, dismissed as an accident, as due to chance. It cries out for some sort of an explanation. And if uh, cosmologists are to avoid the G word, uh, what they're going to do is to appeal to a world ensemble or multiverse of worlds uh, in which all of the constants and quantities of nature vary randomly. And if there is an infinite number of these universes within the world ensemble, then by chance alone, finely tuned universes will appear somewhere in the ensemble and the observers that exist within them will look out and see a finely tuned universe for their existence and think, gosh, there must be a designer when in fact it's all just due to chance. So the multiverse hypothesis for many scientists is really an attempt to multiply your probabilistic resources so as to reduce the improbability of getting a, a finely tuned universe by chance. It's it's like saying there's not just one spin of one roulette wheel, but there are billions of roulette wheels spinning. So somewhere in the system, your number's going to come up. You mentioned the fact that if the universe had not uh, allowed intelligent life, then we wouldn't be here to observe it and so on. We've discussed that in other programs, and you've written on that, uh, Dr. Craig. 
But uh, it, it brings up the anthropic principle and the weak anthropic principle. What, what is the difference between the two? Well, I really don't think that there is a difference between the two. I, I think that the differentiation between strong and weak versions of the anthropic principle is unhelpful. What what the anthropic principle basically says is that our own existence acts as a kind of selection effect upon what we can observe. Namely, we can't observe universes that are incompatible with our existence because if it were, say, too hot or too dense or expanding too rapidly, those conditions would not be conducive to life, and so we couldn't exist to observe them. And so by its by its very nature, our existence acts as a kind of selecting factor on what universes we can observe. We can only observe universes which are appropriately fine-tuned for our existence. And the anthropic principle can be used in conjunction with a world ensemble to say that in the world ensemble of randomly ordered universes, by chance alone, finely tuned universes will appear. And of course, only those universes can be observed by observers. Because in all the other ones, there aren't any observers. No, there isn't any life. So by its very nature, the observers will observe finely tuned universes. And so we shouldn't really be surprised when we look out and see our universe fine-tuned for our existence. It doesn't cry out for a creator or a designer. Rather, it's just by chance, and we couldn't observe anything else. Our observing the universe as a sort of selection process is not the same as saying we create the universe by our observation. Right, that's that's absolutely correct. That would be a misunderstanding. The, the idea is not that our existence somehow makes the universe fine-tuned for our existence or that our existence somehow explains why the universe is fine-tuned for our existence. And that's why the anthropic principle only works if you have a multiverse or world ensemble. You've got to have the multiverse of randomly ordered worlds that is big enough so that by chance alone, somewhere in the ensemble, a life-permitting universe will arise by chance. And then you can use the anthropic principle to uh, tell those observers, well, look, you couldn't observe anything else, so why are you surprised? Uh, it's just by chance. So it, the anthropic principle alone won't do the job. It's got to be the anthropic principle plus the world ensemble or multiverse together. That's what uh, current theorists who want to avoid the G word uh, are appealing in order to explain the fine-tuning of the universe. Let's go to John Leslie's firing squad illustration. I think we might can tie some of this, this together. Why did he give this analogy of the firing squad? What is it? Uh, how does it relate and what is well, it? Well, the... He gave this analogy because early on, people were trying to use the anthropic principle on its own to get rid of design. They were trying to just say, um, well, you oughtn't to be surprised at the fine-tuning of the universe for life because, after all, if it weren't fine-tuned, you wouldn't be here to be surprised about it. So it's no big deal. Well, Leslie uh, said that is like being dragged in front of a firing squad of a hundred trained marksmen, all with rifles, aimed at your heart at point-blank range, and you hear the command given, ready, aim, fire, and then you hear the roar of the guns, and then, then you observe that you're still alive, that all of the 100 marksmen missed. Now, Leslie says, what would you conclude in this case? You wouldn't be surprised that you don't observe that you're dead, because if you were dead, you couldn't observe it. So that's right. There's no surprise that you don't observe that you're dead. But you should still be surprised that you do observe that you're alive, in view of the improbability of all of these marksmen missing. Given the improbability that they would all miss, you should be very surprised that you observe that you're alive, even though you're not surprised that you don't observe that you're dead. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, you would probably conclude that they all missed on purpose, that it was a result of a, some kind of a setup engineered by someone for some reason. So what Leslie is pointing out is 
that in the absence of a world ensemble uh, where all possibilities are actualized, you can't use the anthropic principle to explain away our surprise at seeing the fine-tuning of the universe. You still have to have some explanation for why those marksmen all missed. It's not enough just to say, well, if you if they hadn't all missed, you wouldn't be there to be surprised about it. One guy tried to get around Leslie's analogy by saying that the guy who was about to be shot, after he heard the roar of the guns and he was still alive, he took off his blindfold and there were a hundred other condemned criminals, but one of them was shot. Yeah, see, what he's trying to do is a world ensemble. He's, yeah, he's, he's multiple. Yeah, exactly, and that would be right. He's right. If, if you posit enough firing squads shooting at people that the incredibly infinitesimal possibility that they'd all miss would somewhere be actualized, then, yeah, you, the, the guy shouldn't be surprised that they all missed because somewhere in the ensemble of firing squads and victims, one of them by chance alone would have missed. But uh, that, that just illustrates my point, that the anthropic principle without the world ensemble won't do the trick. You've got to have the multiverse to generate all of those other possibilities. Now, uh, as I say, multiply your probabilistic resources so that somewhere this infinitesimally improbable event is going to happen. People who discuss this topic often refer to the work of Barrow and Tipler. Can you summarize some of the things that they said? Well, Barrow and Tipler wrote a book called The Cosmological Anthropic Principle in 1985, uh, which is just a masterpiece of compiling all of the evidence for fine-tuning in the universe. And they show how incredibly fine-tuned the universe is for our existence. Uh, And then they enunciate a couple of versions of the anthropic principle, as you say, and and attempt to defend it. Um, And I think that their own view uh, does succumb to the criticism that I've just lodged, that the anthropic principle is invalid or impotent in the absence of this world ensemble. So the real question that is facing us today in this whole question of fine-tuning and how is it to be explained is the question, which is the better explanation, an intelligent designer of the universe or a multiverse or world ensemble of universes, of randomly ordered uh, infinite number of worlds? Which is the better explanation of those two? In your new edition of Reasonable Faith, the book, You expand the chapter in dealing with this. Uh, What are some other things that you put in? Well, what I point out is a couple of criticisms of the world ensemble hypothesis that I think make it less preferable to the design hypothesis. And one of these is fairly obvious, namely that if the world ensemble itself is to be a plausible scientific alternative to design, you've got to have some sort of a mechanism for generating the many worlds. You you can't just say they're out there. You need some sort of a a theory that would generate this world ensemble of an infinite number of randomly ordered universes. Well, the best shot at this would be inflationary theory. If the early universe were configured just right, then as the universe expands, there would appear bubbles within it of lower energy vacuum. And these bubbles could each then constitute a separate universe. These would be your little universes within the multiverse that spawns the bubbles. And if there were enough of these and they were randomly ordered, then you'd get your world ensemble. Now, the question is, what about the mechanism that produces these bubble universes? Is it fine-tuned or not? And if it is finely tuned, then obviously the problem hasn't been solved. The world ensemble gets rid of the cosmic designer only if there is no fine-tuning required for the world ensemble. And that is far from obvious. For example, the cosmological constant, which drives inflation, has to be fine-tuned to one part out of 10 to the 120th power. And there's no explanation of that. Also, in the best theory that we have of a kind of theory of everything today, M theory or super string theory, the theory only works if there are exactly 11 dimensions. But the theory itself doesn't explain why the world should have 11 dimensions rather than any other number. So you have a kind of geometrical fine-tuning 
in this case, in the number of dimensions. So it's not at all obvious that the world ensemble hypothesis has eliminated the need for fine-tuning. That's one problem. Here's another problem. As I mentioned earlier, the theorem developed by Bord, Guth, and Vilenkin has shown that the multiverse itself cannot be extended into the infinite past. There had to be a beginning to this multiverse, and ever since its beginning, it's been chugging away producing these bubble universes. Now, think what that implies, Kevin. If it had a beginning, then that means that there can only be as many universes in the ensemble as have been generated since the multiverse began. But in that case, it's going to be a finite number, not an infinite number. And therefore, given the incomprehensible improbability of the fine-tuning, there's no guarantee whatsoever that finely-tuned universes will have appeared yet in the world ensemble of bubble universes. So you don't have an infinite number of randomly ordered worlds in the way that the multiverse hypothesis requires to explain away fine-tuning. So that's just a couple of problems. But perhaps the most damaging objection is the third one, which has been developed by theorists like Roger Penrose, mathematical physicist at Oxford University. What Penrose points out is that if we are just a random member of a world ensemble of uh, randomly ordered worlds, then it is highly, highly probable that we ought to be observing a very different universe than the one we observe. For example, Penrose calculates that the odds of the universe having its exact thermodynamic characteristics is one chance out of 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123, uh, just an incomprehensible number, so that the the odds that the universe would be fine-tuned in the way that we observe it to be are, are just incomprehensibly small. By contrast to that, what are the odds that the solar system would just pop into existence suddenly by the random collision of particles? Just particles jostling around would suddenly, boom, fall into the configuration of our solar system. Well, Penrose figures this out. He says it's about one chance out of ten to the power of 10, to the power of 60. Now, that's an incomprehensibly large number, but it is infinitesimally small compared to one chance out of 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123. In fact, Penrose says it's utter chicken feed by comparison. Now, what does that imply? That implies that if we are just one random member of a world ensemble, then as we look out at the universe, what we ought to be observing in all probability would be a universe no larger than our solar system because that kind of world is vastly more probable than a finely tuned universe like ours. And therefore, our observations disconfirm the world ensemble hypothesis. It, make it, it makes it very, very improbable that we are just a random member in a world ensemble. In fact, the current wrinkle in cosmology today has been to calculate what would be the smallest observable universe there could be. In fact, it would be smaller than the solar system. The smallest observable universe, and therefore the most probable observable universe, to just pop into being from a random collision of particles, would be a universe which consists of a single brain which has the illusion of an external universe around it that, that appears to see an external universe when, in fact, all that exists is just a single brain. And these are called Boltzmann brains uh, after the German uh, 19th century physicist Ludwig Boltzmann. And, and therefore, if that is true, then in all probability, if we are just a member of a random world ensemble, each one of us ought to conclude that he is, in fact, a, a Boltzmann brain and that your hands, your head, the world around you, the trees, the cars, other people, all of these are just illusions of your consciousness, projections of your brain, and that all that really exists is just you, your single Boltzmann brain. Now, if you don't think that you're a Boltzmann brain, if you think you're a respectable, ordinary observer in an external world, then uh, you, you should conclude that, therefore, a world ensemble does not, in all probability, exist. 
Our question of the day, Dr. Craig, this is kind of a rough one. Are we to understand hell as being a place of fire and bodies being burned alive and, and, and so forth? Yeah, I'm not sure what to make of these images in the scriptures of hell that describe it as flames and others describe it as outer darkness. There is the resurrection of the body that does take place. So it, it could be that this would involve a kind of corporal punishment. On the other hand, it seems that the real essence of hell is not in corporal punishment, but it's in spiritual separation from God and a kind of abandonment left apart from all that is good and lovely and true and worthwhile and being abandoned to one's own self and one's own wicked nature. And so Paul says in Thessalonians that those who reject Christ will suffer the punishment of eternal exclusion from the presence of the Lord. So I think that's the real essence of hell, whether or not it will involve corporal punishment or whether these are just dramatic metaphorical images to depict how awful the suffering of this abandonment is. I have an open mind. Yeah, it surely may not be the kind of fire the chemical combustion that we're familiar with on planet Earth. Perhaps. Right, that would require oxygen to burn and, and fuel and things of that sort. That For eternity. Right, that wouldn't seem to make sense. As well, biblical descriptions describe hell as torment and not torture. Torture being from without the corporal punishment. Torment being more of an internal conscience aspect. Yeah, my only reservation about that, as I say, is that I do think that the scriptures teach the resurrection of the body, and not just for the saved, but I think that the unsaved also will uh, be raised and then judged. And so that makes one wonder, well, maybe there will be a kind of corporal torment as well as the anguish of being separated from the presence of the Lord. In any case, these images certainly mean to convey to us that this is awful, that it's unspeakably painful and and therefore we have to do everything to avoid it don't go there yeah don't go there for more resources like these from dr william lane craig go to reasonablefaith.org that's reasonablefaith.org